Hi, and welcome to another episode of World Beyond Belief. My name is Paul Marco, and I'm going to be here with you the entire hour. Today we have a fascinating topic. The major topic is going to be climate change, although we're going to focus on that toward the end. What I want to do is show you in the beginning is a process that I use to begin looking at possible deceptions. Now, I was a psychologist all my life, but not a clinical psychologist. I was an organizational psychologist, which means I was a group psychologist. And what we focus on, rather than the individual, are patterns, groups, how groups interact, patterns in their behavior, what processes they use to do whatever they're doing, and looking at motivations and outcomes to see how the whole thing works in terms of human dynamics. And I always do that when I'm looking at anything that comes up in the news, anything that could be possibly a deception. I run this little pattern and I look at the dynamics of the situation before I get involved. And we're going to do that with climate change after I teach you the patterns. First of all, there are three players in any hoax. The first of these groups the first player is the hoaxer. In most of our hoax nowadays, there's a psychopathic group that does most of the hoaxing. It's the deceiver, and this group creates the illusion. If you go back to some hoaxes in the past, you've got the Kennedy assassination. Depending on how far up the pyramid you want to go to find out who was the original deceiver, you can go all the way up to the secret societies and even beyond. Of course, it was carried out by lower level people like George H.W. Bush, Lyndon Johnson, the CIA, the Mafia. You'll find that these groups are involved in most of the deceptions. If you go back to the Gulf of Tonkin incident where they used a false flag to get us into the Vietnam War, of course, the the hoaxer would be the U.S. military and the U.S. government to get us into that. There's another group. There's always another group. And I call them the perpetually hoaxed, or the fooled, or the mark, or the willfully ignorant. Because nowadays, there's no reason to be hoaxed. Because we have the internet, we have a lot of news sources, and there's a lot of people doing a lot of deep research. Back when the Kennedy assassination happened, all we had was newspapers, TV. The general public really didn't have information to, to raw data to put things together. So most of us were in the category of the perpetually hoaxed. Now, there's also a third category, and I'm going to call them the increasingly unhoaxable. These are the people who are skeptical, they can see hoaxes when they're coming. They're willing to do research to find out the truth, and they don't want to be lied to anymore. In the Kennedy assassination, there were true researchers that hung in there and were able to eventually get everything out on the table. The U.S. government eventually came clean on the Gulf of Tonkin incident in the New York Times. So there's always these three groups. There's always the hoaxer, there's always the people that they can hoax, the perpetually hoaxed, I call them. And now, there's a new group called the increasingly unhoaxable. And here's how the dynamic works. The dynamic between these three groups goes as follows. First of all, uh, the hoaxers lead with a deception. And this is generally to create a problem and wait for the perpetually hoaxed to react. This is the Charlie Hebdo deception. Now the second stage in this dynamic is to wait for the perpetually hoaxed to respond because they have to react to the hoaxer to move this dynamic on. After they react, the psychopathic hoaxers can swing into action doing what they intended to do in the first place. And the 911, the perpetually hoaxed, reacted, oh, save us from the terrorists. And the hoaxers, which were in place the whole time, attacked Iran and Afghanistan. So that's how it works. 
In this particular hoax, the Charlie Hebdo massacre, these signs were likely printed up before the massacre happened. So they would be in place to register the perpetually hoaxed reaction and spur the hoaxers on to doing what they wanted to do in the first place, which is probably the vilification of the Muslims, the crackdown on free speech, maybe some sympathy for the, uh, the Jews involved. Um, there's a multitude of motivations that these people have if it's moving them a little closer to their goal. But increasingly what's happening now is the unhoaxables are debunking and linking the hoaxes with the hoaxers immediately. This interferes big time with the psychopathic hoaxers ability to manipulate through this dynamic, through this organizational dynamic that they have. Problem, where they create a problem, reaction, and then impose their solution. So what the hoaxers are doing now is they're doing everything they can to shut down and discredit the increasingly unhoaxable. They're doing it through limits on internet freedom and also discrediting anybody that comes forward with an idea that's counter to the hoaxer's idea or a worldview that's counter to the ho hoaxer's worldview. So, how can you tell a psychopathic hoaxer? Well, that's easy. Well, the psychopathic hoaxers, they always have the same game plan in mind, which is global governance. There's a, a cadre of people that are in government, our government, and governments ac across the world that are all about setting in place a one world government, where of course the oligarchs rule and people are treated like slaves. These uh, people belong to secret societies. The hoaxers belong to secret societies. And they're all basically psychopaths. They're in favor of sponsoring wars. They're in favor of torture. They're all, they all back the eugenics agenda. Actually, the eugenics agenda to, some say, reduce the population to 500 million. And they all have this one world government thing in mind. We have before us the opportunity to forge for ourselves and for future generations a new world order, a world where the rule of law, not the law of the jungle, governs the conduct of nations. When we are successful, and we will be, we have a real chance at this new world order, an order in which a credible United Nations can use its peacekeeping role to fulfill the promise and vision of the UN's founders. Yeah, they're all interested in this new world order thing. It's not good for you or me. Also, the hoaxers in this situation, the situation we're dealing with today, they control the mainstream media, they control all the, uh, the networks and the media companies. They control academia. They give grants to uh, academia and so they can take grants away. So they control who's in what position and what they're saying. They also control scientific findings as much as possible. They're the ones, the hoaxers, the ones that convinced us that GMOs are a good idea, that fracking is a good idea scientifically. And of course, they've convinced us that global warming is a reality. And since they control the media and they control education, they control our reality. And they control this little box of consensual reality that most of us live in. The smaller the box, the more they're able to deceive, the more their hoaxes work. Let me use this little picture frame uh, illustration to show you how they control our reality. If you look at the frame within the frame, the opening for the painting, that's consensual reality. If you can imagine that being consensual reality, that's where they like to keep us. Uh, thinking that 911 was done by Muslims, that Muslims were the most evil people on earth. They like us to think that 
there's a Democratic and a Republican Party and that they represent different ideologies and both represent the people. It's the reality that they want us to have and they want us to keep us in that. It's reinforced by the mainstream media, by education. They want us in that mindset. Now, if you back out a little bit and you look at the, the mat, the white mat around that core reality, that's called the margins. And they allow the margins to exist, I suppose, to keep us interested. Because we're allowed to go into the margins and then and something from the margins seem to drift in and out of the core reality. For example, vegetarianism was not part of the core reality in the beginning of the 20th century for most people. It was definitely in the margins, though, because there could be people that were vegetarians. Now, later on, vegetarians are more mainstream, because so it's more part of the core reality. They control what comes in and out. They control fashion. They control what we believe is real and what we believe is sane. When vegetarianism drifts into the core reality, then it becomes more sane. It's not part of the margins anymore. So there are situations that they'll allow to come in from the margins or go out to the margins, depending on what suits their plan for the new world order. What they're terrified of is the frame. If you look at the black frame, the black frame is the fringe. They don't want you going into fringe. They'll give a stigma. They'll give you a stigma if you believe something in the fringe. It used to be that people that thought that 911 was an inside job had to lurk in the fringes. Now it's getting to be more in the margins and it's starting to work its way into the core reality. When it gets into the core reality, they're going to have to manage it, so they're afraid of it. There are other things in the fringes that we need to investigate and find out about. All these false flags. And climate change deniers, oddly enough, are now relegated to the fringe. It's such a wild idea. It's not even in the margins. These people have to be crazy. Holocaust deniers have to live in the fringe, even though it's kind of the more and more research that you do on it, you find that their reality is the true reality. So the fact that it's in the fringe doesn't mean that it's not true. It means that they don't want you to believe it's true, and they manage the fringe. Let's move along to the perpetually hoaxed. Now, it's very true that we all came from the ranks of the perpetually hoaxed. When we were young and naive and didn't know what was going on, we were all there. But there's some people, even with the internet and being shown that they've been deceived, will just keep staying in the perpetually hoaxed camp. They live in the core reality. They seldom go into the fringes. They're obedient and they seldom question. Their obedience is actually the biggest problem in this whole dynamic. TV and print media, the mainstream, are the influence of their major opinions. And they follow anything that comes out of academia. And the amazing thing about this group, they'll fight tooth and nail to defend the hoaxer's core reality, the consensual reality they'll go to the mat for. It's amazing. So moving along, how can you tell the increasingly unhoaxable? Well, that's pretty easy. Whatever's in the core reality, they're skeptical of. They have a willingness to do research into ideas that are outside of their belief system. In other words, they'll never say something like, well, even if that were true, I still believe blah, 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 blah. No, they're probably writing down your source to find out where your truth comes from, so it can be their truth also. They're getting really good at seeing patterns and hoaxes. And since we've had the same hoaxers for a long time, it's real easy to know their modus operandi. They're doing something that is totally amazing even in the 21st century. They're working because they feel like they have a duty, because they have a love. It's the most amazing thing I've ever seen growing up totally in a financially driven economy where people only do things for money to see people in this community working for nothing. Also, 
There's an interesting quote from Mark Twain, and it goes, it's easier to deceive someone than it is to convince them they've been deceived. Well, these unhoaxable have gone beyond that. They were probably originally deceived, and then through their research and their open-mindedness, they found out truth. Now, it's totally, totally impossible to re-hoax them because they know the truth. They got to the bottom of it. You find that people in this community have generally come from the ranks of the perpetually hoaxed, and they got tired of it, and they moved over, and they decided it's no more. I'm going to know what's going on. And they can't be hoaxed back into being the perpetually hoaxed. Anyway, that's them. Okay, let's look at some information on the hoaxes themselves. Remember that all these hoaxes must lead to the problem-reaction-solution dynamic. That's what they're created for. Now, first of all, we can say that they all originated from the Committee of 300 in Tavistock, but they were probably hatched in one of Tavistock's think tanks. Could be something like a uh, think tank like the Project for the New American Century. Now, this group, of course, you know, hatched the need for 911. Or it could be the Rand Corporation, Heritage Institute, Bilderberg Group, or the Trilateral Commission, Club of Rome, Club of Madrid, la 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 la. There are lots and lots of these organizations. Now, these master planners then delegate the implementation to other organizations, depending on the type of hoax that they've come up with. Since these hoaxers control the reality-making machines like Hollywood, NASA, and the mainstream print and video media, most of these deceptions are scripted and carried out much like a movie or TV documentary. They are skilled at making a falsity seem real. Because of this relationship between Hollywood movies and the hoaxers, I've divided the type of hoaxes into categories that would correspond to a type of entertainment media. The first category is... The action-adventure hoax. Now, these are hoaxes or false flags that happen or are made to look like happen to some degree in physical reality. These are hoaxes like the Pearl Harbor 911, uh, the recent San Bernardino Jihad, and so forth. They're usually run or orchestrated by one of the intelligence agencies. Generally, a lot of the intelligence agencies work together. Now, some of the components of these include they're allowed to happen. In other words, security services, in the case of 911, NORAD stood down. It, this is a component of most of them, because if you have security in place, if the cameras are working, this can't happen. So they've got to have that shut down. They can be executed or orchestrated by the CIA or other intelligence agency people, like the Paris attacks, where they are executed by the experts, and then there's a patsy nearby. Patsies like uh, Sirhan Sirhan, the underwear bomber, and so forth. They're always standing by. They can also be done by the jihadists themselves, like the San Bernardino Jihad, uh, trained and schooled by the security services and then allowed to happen. And, of course, there's always the classic false flag operations, where a military or a proxy military, like ISIS or Al-Qaeda, takes action on behalf of the hoaxers, claiming to be something or someone else. For example, Pearl Harbor was executed by the Japanese Air Force, of course, with the permission of the President of the United States. ISIS is allowed to attack Syria as a proxy army for the United States. A lot of these action adventures have identifying marks like surveillance cameras are generally not working, there's a drill going on that replicates the event, the follow-up mainline stories already in place, like Jesui Charlie, the 911 already knowing that it's Muslim jihadists. A lot of times if it's outside, they take place on a dead-end street or a cul-de-sac where a little interference or traffic is going to get in the way. Also, they take place in gun-free zones so no one gets shot that aren't supposed to get shot. Many times there's a library or a place for the crisis actors to apply makeup or get ready. The coroner that's going to investigate it is in place. And the official story is always, always murky at first. Let's move along to another category. This category I call 
the documentary hoax. This is where the hoax is created by administrative scripting. Uh, it's backed up by scientific fraud or fabrication from whole cloth at times. Examples of such frauds are, you know, the peak oil fraud, uh, frauds connected with weaponized diseases like Ebola, AIDS, and the old Spanish flu. Overpopulation is always a hoax that goes under this category. This is the favorite hoax by oligarchs since they're, they're always compulsive eugenics fanatics. Other documentaries hoaxes include Peak Water, which is still to come, uh, the energy crisis, which we live through constantly, uh, the moon landings are another hoax, and the upcoming life on Mars hoax, which is still in the, in the making. These work by thinking up a crisis. One of these think tanks thinks up a crisis and then makes a story to back up the crisis with the facts and figures they need. Hopefully these facts and figures can't be verified, but if they can be found to be false, the people that blow the whistle on them are either put into the fringe or eliminated completely. You know, the hoaxers generally control all the polls and all the worldwide record keeping. So they can fabricate any problem out of whole cloth if necessary. Peak oil is a great example. Oil has been found recently not even to be a fossil fuel. It's a naturally occurring substance that's prevalent within the earth. But peak oil, as a hoax, allows a scarcity which can play into the hands of the hoaxers as a valuable hoax. So documentary hoaxes are alive and well, and that's our other category. The last category, and this is a new category coming up, I'm calling it the comedy inspirational category. Now the Pope is going to play big time into this comedy inspirational thing. For example, the Pope is going to be involved probably in orchestrating a new world religion which will fall under a new messiah, which will probably be, if, if I reckon my predictions are correct, it'll be a false alien messiah. Now it could have been started by the BS story by Zachariah Sitchin about the Anunnaki. Now there's a new hoax that's begun called the Black Knight Satellite Decoded Hoax. This is the story of a 13,000 year old satellite set in place by the Anunnaki that wants Earth to respond and ask for it to return. It's a cool idea. I think I want to call this a comedy since a major player in the production was Irving Azoff's Levity Entertainment Group, a major fabricator of comedy entertainment and owner of comedy clubs. Now that you know the categories, let's take our new knowledge and look at our recent false flags and see what we can tell about it.
Well, that was fun, looking at uh, the analysis of a false flag that happened in Paris. But as promised, let's move along to global warming or man-made climate change. Let's see if we can do analysis on that. Remember, this is a different type of problem, reaction, solution. The problem here is a documentary problem. It's not something that has to occur in the physical world. It can occur totally on paperwork. Okay, now what we want to do is look at the dynamics of the situation, who's involved, where the money's going, before we're going to look at any of the science. Now it looks like the dynamic is between the good guys, which are the green guys, which are, you know, people like Gore and Obama, and those dastardly oil companies and those, those energy companies. Now, to find the origin of this man-made global warming and climate change, we just have to go back to the late 60s to a meeting of the Club of Rome. Now, if you don't know who the Club of Rome is, it's an organization dedicated, basically, it's a eugenics organization dedicated to reducing the population to 500 million. And it works right directly for Tavistock. And Tavistock are the people that have been set organizing everything since the 1930s. They set up World War II, they set up the hippie movement. I mean, our lives have been orchestrated by Tavistock, and this is a kind of a think tank for Tavistock. The meeting of the Club of Rome was held by uh, the Rockefellers at the Rockefeller Estate in Italy. And the Rockefellers at this time controlled a lot of the oil holdings of Standard Oil Company, and they controlled all the patents for all the clean energy devices that could have interfered with their oil and other energy explorations. So it's kind of ironic that this organization sets in Italy and come up, comes up with a problem to unite people called global warming or pollution or climate change. Now, this problem the fact that it was started by a Tavistock think tank is my first red flag to the fact that it might be a scam. Now, the way they present this problem is that it's, it's good against evil. It's the people against these money-hungry oil companies. And I agree that it's the people against money-hungry people, but I don't think it's the oil companies that are the bad guys. But let's look further. First of all, let's look at the good guys. Let's look at uh, the money and who comprises the good guys in this situation. Well, first of all, we have to mention that the entire country of the United States, the government, and the United Nations are backing the notion of man-made climate change. To find the good guys in this, Let's go to the NASA Global Climate Change website. Now, if you're familiar with hoaxes, you realize that NASA is one of the bigger hoaxes, but they certainly are on the side of this pro-climate change. I mean, this would be a red flag for me, the fact that NASA is backing it. And here are some societies that are also backing the man-made global warming theory. American Association for the Advancement of Science, the American Chemical Society, the American Geophysical Union, American Medical Association, there you go, the AMA, uh, the American Meteorological Society, the, the American Physical Society, Geological Society of America. And uh, there's a lot of science and academic organization, government agencies, intergovernmental bodies, that support this notion. Actually, I found a website that lists the top 100 climate change sites, and on this site listed a whole bunch, well, 100. Uh, among them was the United Nations World Meteorological Organization, the WMO, the Center for Atmospheric Science, World Wildlife Fund, the Woods Hole Research Center on Global Warming, the BBC News on climate change, and of course, Greenpeace and many others. Okay, here's another interesting website that's pro uh, man-made climate change. The Climate Central, who we are, an independent organization of leading scientists and journalists 
researching and reporting the facts about our changing climate and its impact on the American public, what we do, survey and conduct scientific research on climate change, informs the public of key findings, our scientists publish our journals, report on science, energy, and sea level rise. And here's some of their funding sources. And I noticed that there's uh, Google.org, NASA Goddard Space Center here, NASA headquarters, NASA and Langley, the National Institute of Health, John Hopkins University. These are big names. Oh, Rockefeller Brothers Fund. Who would ever thought that they would get involved in this since they thought it up? U.S. Army Corps of Engineers, Bureaus of Reclamation. Yeah, there's a lot of people funding this. Speaking of funding, let's go to the government. Okay, this is something, all these are going to be listed below so you can peruse them at your leisure. This is from the Congressional Budget Office about the Federal Climate Change Program's funding history and policy issues. And I just want to bring your attention to one little piece of information here. Funding for Federal Climate Change Programs from 1998 to 2009. Appropriations for agencies work Related to climate change, total about 99 billion with a B in 2009 dollars. More than a third of that sum was provided in fiscal year 2009. In addition, climate related tax preferences reduced tax revenues by a much smaller amount. And it, does, and it goes down and says, for most of that period, federal resources devoted to examining and mitigating climate change grew slowly and unevenly. When adjusted for inflation, regular annual appropriation rose from $4.0 billion in 1998 to $7.5 billion in, 19, in 2009. During that period, the nation's commitment to climate-related technology development increased significantly. Blah, 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 blah. So you can see there's a lot of federal dollars going into this climate change proposition. I just wanted to show you one more website since we're on money. It's What's Up With That, and these will all be listed below. It's called The Well-Funded Climate Business, Follow the Money. And this just shows the box that we were talking about before on a graph. Actually, it shows the in the purple color, this, this thin line, this shows foreign assistance. And I'm sure this is to help other countries understand that this global warming is for real. Uh, climate technology is the light blue section, and it's been increasing and increasing. And the bottom section is climate science. This is all this money goes to measuring and showing that global warming is real. And if you go down to the bottom of this, it says the Congressional Research Service estimates that since 2008, the federal government has spent nearly $70 billion on climate change activities. If this is a hoax, this is a big hoax. Okay, well, we can see by those numbers that we have a well-funded movement here. The pro-man-made climate change is really fun. It's got a lot of money going, going behind it. Also, add to that the fact that, number one, this uh, situation, man-made global warming, is taught as a fact in American public schools and in public schools throughout the world. Also, in doing this research, I discovered people who have actual degrees in man-made climate change. That's how, that's how powerful this movement is. All mainstream media uh, supports the notion of man-made climate change. Now you're going to say, what about the conservative media? Well, the conservative media are playing their part in advancing this, and I'll explain that when we get into them in just a minute. Uh, federally funded colleges and universities support the notion of global warming. The government gives out about $2 billion for climate change research, and this is totally, totally, totally reserved for findings for scientists that are going to find in favor of the notion of man-made global warming. Also, 
climate change deniers, that's a label now, climate change deniers are being equated with Holocaust deniers, like lunatics, people that are really crazy. They don't know what they're talking about. And any society that can orchestrate a movement against an opinion like that has got to be controlled by Tavistock. It's got to be controlled by the central controlling mechanism. All these things, the funding, the uh, adoption by all the mainstream, the demonization of the deniers, all make me think it's a hoax. But let's move on. I came across this website from the Union of Concerned Scientists. Uh, global warming skeptic organization. An overwhelming majority of scientists agree global warming is happening and human activity is the primary cause. Yet several prominent global warming skeptic organizations are actively working to sow doubt about the facts of global warming. These organizations play a role in the fossil fuel industry's disinformation playbook a strategy designed to confuse the public about global warming and delay action on climate change. Now, we saw the pro-man-made global warming side. It's all the governments, all the organizations, all the media, um, massive federal funding. Here are the, here's the other side. Here's the first one, the American Enterprise Institute. The American Enterprise Institute has routinely tried to undermine the credibility of climate science, despite at times affirming the weight of evidence justifies prudent action on climate change. I think it's important to note the weight of evidence justifies. So it's, a, it's against climate change, but not that much against climate change. For years, the AEI played a role in propagating misinformation about a manufactured controversy over emails stolen from climate, stolen from climate scientists, with the AEI research fellow even claiming, quote, there's no consensus about the extent and cause of global warming. And then we get down to see their funding right here. AEI received $3,615,000 from ExxonMobil and more than $1 million in funding from the Koch Brothers Foundation from 2004 to 2011. Now, the Koch Brothers are a major funder, but look at this funding compared to the funding that we just looked for the pro-global warming side. The Koch Brothers are going to play the role of the uh, Sunni Wahhabists in this scenario. They're the Tea Party. They're the bad boys. They're the dirty business owners. But like all globalists, these guys make money by raping the public. Congress does inside training, pork barrel politics, aiding terrorists by funding them, like Obama. And I could get all, go on all day talking about globalists funding bad things happening. Let's go down to the American Legislative Exchange Council. The American Legislative Exchange Council maintains that, quote, global climate change is inevitable and since the 1990s has pushed various forms of model legislation aimed at obstructing policies intended to reduce global warming emissions. And if we go down and look at the funding here, we can see that the ALC received more than 1.6 million from ExxonMobil and more than 850,000 from the Koch brothers. Moving on to the Beacon Hill Institute at Suffolk University. These economic analysis are at times accompanied by a dose of climate contrarianism. For example, the BHI director claims the very question of whether the climate is warming is in doubt. Okay, can't be saying that. The BHI has publicly acknowledged its Koch funding, which likely includes at least some 
the approximately 725,000 the Charles G. Cope Foundation contributed to Suffolk University. Again with the Koch brothers. Now we move to the Cato Institute. Now the Cato Institute was set up by the Koch brothers. Cato acknowledges that global warming is indeed real. But when it comes to the causes of global warming, Cato has sent mixed messages over the year. Cato's website, for instance, reports that human activity has been a contributor to global warming since 75. Yet on the same topic of whether human activity is responsible for global warming, Cato's vice president has written, we don't know. Well, you know, this doesn't sound like opposition. It sounds like, yeah, the jury's out. You know, this is, if this is the opposition that's opposing all this federal funding, Okay, let's move to the Competitive Enterprise Institute. CEI received about $2 million in funding from ExxonMobil and uh, received funding from the Koch Brothers Foundation back, dating back to the 1980s. The Heartland Institute has the same thing. Received about 675000 from Exxon and millions from the Koch-funded organizations. Now, let's focus in on the next one. This is the Heritage Foundation. The Heritage Foundation is a straight-out Tavistock think tank. It has no other purpose. It works for Tavistock. It is designed to manipulate your opinions, to create social movements. So this is a Tavistock. This is a global governance organization. And if we go down here and look at the funding, Heritage received more than 4.5 million from Coke foundations and of course ExxonMobil. When Coke is contributing to a Heritage Foundation corporation, he is showing, they are showing that they are in league with the globalists, that they are indeed globalists because the Heritage is straight out and out Tavistock. And we can go down the Institute for Energy Research and IER has received funding from both ExxonMobil and the Koch brothers. And then we go on and on and on. What we have here is we have the, the opposition set up. You know that when a globalist does anything, any kind of a hoax, they have to control both sides. A long time ago, 50 years ago, with the Saudi Arabia oil money, they started funding the schools that would train Sunni Wahhabi fundamentalists that we're dealing with today. So that side, the Muslim side, was created by the globalists to create this mayhem and this problem. This side, I contend. The side that we're seeing as the bad guys opposing global warming, I think, are a puppeted aspect of the global warming hoax itself. I don't think that what we're seeing here is the real opposition to global warming. Well, let's move along to the motivation. Why would someone want to create a hoax, if, if this is a hoax? Well, there's two major reasons. The one reason is money. If you're looking into these hoaxes, the people that benefit from the hoaxes always benefit at least partially financially. And many people are going to benefit from this. For example, Obama and Gore, they're both involved with these carbon trading schemes. Uh, when Gore left the White House, he was worth about $2 million. Now he's worth about $35 million thanks to global warming. This guy charges $175,000 speaking fee. But the real reason is control. The carbon tax would affect everyone in the entire world because it would monitor all human activities. It would change how land was used it would change land ownership. If land ownership was allowed to continue, I'd be very surprised. The monitoring and taxing of carbon taxes would allow you to monitor all human activities. Whatever you're doing, whatever you're moving, if you're moving equipment, whatever you're doing, 
they need to know because they, can, they need to tax you. It can totally control population expansion and leads to eugenics. And of course, you know, if you're following the uh, global elite, uh, whether it's the uh, Soros, Gore, Koch brothers, or who, Rockefellers, or whoever it is, they're into eugenics and killing a lot of us off. And this would control the world population because this would lead into their, their other big hoax, which is the overpopulation hoax. And if you want to know how the carbon tax would work out, you just have to look at what happened in Australia when they passed the carbon tax and then quickly unpacked it. But there is some real opposition, and the oppositions are coming from strange areas. They're coming from countries that are not under the boot of the United States or the United Nations. Uh, specifically, two of them are China and India. This, is, this information is from a Breitbart article, and the article is entitled, Paris Climate Talks Are Doomed Because China Knows Climate Change is a Hoax. It starts off with a quote by Obama. The fact of the matter is that there's a reason why you have the largest gathering of the world's leaders probably in the world history here in Paris. Everyone else is taking climate change seriously. Like a lot of the president's statements on climate change, this isn't actually true. In fact, there's lots and lots of people in the world who know it's a hoax. And among them, unfortunately, happen to be the ruling elite of the most significant carbon-emitting nation of them all, China. We know this because of a devastating report released by the Global Warming Policy Foundation, written by one of the West's leading experts on the Chinese environmental economy, Patricia Adams. Adams, an economist, executive director of the Toronto-based Probe International, who has been working with the Chinese environment movement since the mid-80s, is under absolutely no illusions about China's real position on climate change. China sees it as a brilliant opportunity to fleece the gullible Gualio for as much money as it can, to burnish its international image by making all the right green noises and to blackmail the West into providing it with free technology. But it has no intention whatsoever of sacrificing economic growth by reducing its carbon dioxide emissions. And I've heard that India is following the same pattern. And then there's Russia. Support Russian President Vladimir Putin. Putin, fresh off of single-handedly altering the dynamic in the Middle East, now says global warming is being used as an economic weapon against his country. He characterized climate change as a fraud used to prevent Russia from tapping its vast oil and natural gas reserves. Putin's senior economic advisor from the early 2000s, Andrei Ilyarinov, told the New York Times, We found that while climate change does exist, it is cyclical, and the anthropogenic role is very limited. It became clear that the climate is a complicated system, and that so far, the evidence presented for the need to fight global warming was rather unfounded. And there is one other group that's opposed or is skeptical about man-made global warming. And if you guessed the increasingly unhoaxable, you guessed right. Yes, it seems to be... There are some countries that aren't under NATO or under, aren't under the boot of NATO, uh, like China and Russia. And there are some independent people who, risking their own reputation, have come out against the notion of man-made global warming. So let's sum up the dynamic that we're looking for. Okay, if we look at the dynamics, we could go with the hoaxers. First of all, are there hoaxers involved? Yes, there are very wealthy, very influential hoaxers. And they've even created another side, which they always do. They've created the Koch brothers side. So we have a dynamic. We have good guys against bad guys. And the good guys are the global warming guys. And it's just the perfect dynamic for the good guys to win. Let's move on to the second component. Are the perpetually hoaxed, hoaxed, 
They certainly are. They're doing exactly what the hoaxers want them to do. They're out in force. They want the carbon tax. They're falling for it hook, line, and sinker. And the increasingly unhoaxables are doing what we'd expect them to do. They're finding holes in the logic, and they're watching the hoaxers, like they always do, hoax us. But I'll tell you what, there's a bottom line, there are three things that are involved in this hoax that seem consistent with all the other hoax that really put it over the top. So before we go in and analyze the science on both sides, I want you to hear these three things. The first one is hoaxers, the hoaxes never allow for subsequent investigations. If you remember 911, they cleaned up the streets. They had people shopping right away. No substantive investigation ever worked. Sandy Hook's the same way. There was no real investigation into what happened because it might upset the people that were killed. In this one, the climate change debate is settled. But the debate is settled. Climate change is a fact. And when our children's children look us in the eye and ask if we did all we could to leave them a safer, more stable world with new sources of energy, I want us to be able to say, yes, we did. So no further investigation. The second one is that there's a solution that comes in right as soon as the problem is there. On 911, we know who did it, and we knew we had to attack Afghanistan and Iraq. Also, the Patriot Act had been written before 911. So we were ready for that. That's what they do before these hoaxes. When Sandy Hook happened, they were ready to go into the gun confiscation agenda. So that's what always happens. There's a solution identified the minute the problem is, is noticed. The solution here is carbon tax. Now, it's not it doesn't address a lot of the things that are going on in the world. It doesn't address fracking, which is ruining the world. It doesn't address um, nuclear radiation. It doesn't address the fact that the GMOs really use so much Roundup. I mean, it doesn't, it takes the focus off of a whole bunch of environmental things that are for real and puts it on the carbon tax, which as we know, makes people rich and is gonna limit the shit out of your freedom. The third thing deals with these solutions. The solutions are always painful and they're always preposterous. In 911, the solution was to attack Afghanistan and Iraq. Meanwhile, the perpetrators were from Saudi Arabia. Why didn't we attack Saudi Arabia? And also limit our freedoms. George Bush said that they attacked us because of our freedoms. So I guess limiting our freedoms would be a good response. But the solutions are always painful, and this is no exception. This would ruin some third world countries. This is, this, right now the thought of this is keeping Africans from having air conditioning, having any kind of a middle class lifestyle. And the solutions are always preposterous. To limit our freedoms in response to 911 is ridiculous. To put a carbon tax in that tax all, all, all human activities is ridiculous and preposterous. So what I'm saying, just to sum up, is the dynamics of climate change really look like a hoax. Really looks like a false flag. The same people are involved. The solutions roll out the same. And if I were looking into this new for the first time, I'd take into account this human dynamics, these, these interplays between characters, where the money goes. I'd look at that before I get into the science. Because quite frankly, nowadays, science is for sale. Anybody can buy any notion that they want if they have enough money. And the hoaxers, in this case, have enough money. Well, I hope that this has been helpful to you in looking at hoaxes, specifically the climate change hoax. And uh, I look forward to seeing you on a subsequent World Beyond Belief.